let us pray. Loving God, we pray that you will give us ears to listen, minds to understand, and hearts to love. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> While it's logistically a little complicated, it is great to be able to worship in the great outdoors with you here today at our 9 o'clock and 11.15 services. But we always wonder when we schedule these services, what will the weather be like and when we end up needing to move the services indoors. This week, though, we were keeping our eyes and our weather apps trained on Hurricane Ian and praying for all, including family and friends whose lives and homes and livelihoods were right in the middle of it all when the cone of uncertainty became for them the cone of great and destructive certainty. As a native Floridian who's lived three quarters of my life there, I know well the stress of watching these massive storms slowly barreling toward the thin peninsula of land precariously placed between the Atlantic and Gulf. As with so many who live along the coast, I grew up used to the seasonal rhythm of hurricane tracking and preparation of extra days built into the school calendars, not for snow and ice, but for hurricane days. And knowing we could lose electricity for a few hours or days, or as was the case for us in 2004 for a few weeks. I can also attest that you can never totally get used to the emotional stress and strain of knowing that the storm is coming for your state and county and neighborhood, and that there is not one thing you can do to change its path. You can evacuate, you can prepare your home with flashlights and generators and supplies and with hurricane shutters and sandbags. But ultimately, you learn how to wait out the storms and then emerge to survey the damage or hopefully the lack thereof. One thing I've noticed after hurricanes, tornadoes, and storms that bring hailstones and many inches of rain is that when the sun emerges after the storms have passed, we're drawn naturally to come out of our houses and look up into the sky, hoping that we might see a rainbow. People in coastal South Carolina where Ian came back ashore after devastating so much of Southwest and Central Florida posted photos and videos on social media of a very vibrant full arc rainbow that showed up in the sky over Georgetown and Pauley's Island. As one local South Carolina television reporter captioned his photo of the rainbow after every storm, even Ian. When we see a rainbow in the sky, especially after a major storm has blown through, we feel comforted. Perhaps we're reminded of the story we hear in Genesis and the promise connected with what God said when he put a rainbow in the clouds following the great flood. The one when Noah had to build the ark and save some of each of the animals along with his family. Sometimes after especially devastating storms like the three in a row that hit Florida in 2004, or Katrina in 2005, or Ian just this week. I've wondered how these storms and all the flooding that they bring square with what we read in Genesis 9. Didn't God say he would never again flood the earth? But as I read the passage more closely this week, along with reading what others have written about it, I see that I haven't actually been reading Genesis carefully enough. But first, going back a bit to the end of Genesis 8, verses 20 to 22, God makes another promise, which is in fact a covenant with the earth itself. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelt the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. 
What we find at the end of Genesis 8 is a promise that God will not curse the ground, the earth, because of humankind's sinfulness. And related to that, God will never again destroy every living creature. The sign of this promise is what we experience still to this day as the changing of the seasons, as the earth rotates around the sun in the course of the year, and the daily changing from day to night as the earth itself rotates the full 360 degrees each 24 hours. The very presence of the changing seasons as we're experiencing right now with the change from summer to fall is itself a sign of God's covenant with the earth. The very change of light to dark, sunrise to noonday sun, to sunset to the dark of night and back again is another sign of God's covenant with the planet itself. This is something you may not have considered before. I know I hadn't. As we often think of God making covenants or promises just with us, with humankind. But as, in fact, as we see here at the end of Genesis 8, God is in relationship and in covenant with the earth itself and every living creature therein. In our human-centered worldview, though, we are apt to forget this, if we ever realized it to begin with. Of course, God can make a covenant with whoever or whatever God pleases. So when we hear God's promise in Genesis 9, this covenant with Noah, in fact, builds on the foundation of that earlier covenant with the earth and its creatures that I just read to you from Genesis 8. In Genesis 9, which we heard read today, what God promises is that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. So God wasn't saying we wouldn't have any more floods. What God was saying was that future floods wouldn't be such that they would destroy all of human and animal kind, as they did in the times of Noah. But there is more to this covenant than promising that there would not be planetary flooding that would wipe out all humans and other life forms. The promise God is making here, which we call the Noahic covenant, is that God was going to find another way to respond to, God, to humankind's sinful nature. The promises we read in Genesis 8 and 9 are examples of what happens when God decides to change course, when God changes God's mind about how to respond to our mistakes, our sins, humanity's missteps. I will not destroy you or the animals and plants entrusted to your care. I will come up with another course of action, another way out that will be based on forgiveness rather than on punishment. What we hear God promising in the covenant recorded in Genesis 9 is an early moment in the very long series of events that ultimately leads to Jesus coming to be born of Mary, living and dying as one of us so that he could conquer sin and death in a different way, not through a global flood. Noah and the flood are part of that ongoing story of the relationship between God and humanity that paved the way for the incarnation of God and Jesus. The word became flesh so that all flesh would no longer live in fear of everything being wiped out by a great flood. Jesus came to give us another way to be with God and God with us. And rainbows are one of the many ways God has chosen to communicate this great love for us, this great deep desire to be in relationship with us. God set his bow in the sky, which some have taken to mean that he set his bow or his weapon aside, hanging it upside down amongst the clouds as a sign of God's change of course, a change of heart toward humanity. What I find most compelling, though, about God communicating with us through placing rainbows in the sky after a storm is found in the science behind rainbows. A rainbow is what we see when light is refracted through water droplets. That's why you have to have rain to have rainbows. Mm -hmm. But 
What light shining through water droplets reveals is not simply something beautiful that we can behold in the sky. We also learn something very important about light by looking at rainbows. When the sun's rays shine through the raindrops, something otherwise unseen is revealed. Light has color. And not only that, but light is made up of many colors. The sun's rays shining through the raindrops makes it gloriously clear that there is a wide spectrum of colors of light. All, all the colors in the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and purple. Among the very first things God made when God created the world, as portrayed in the creation story, are the sky, the sun, the moon, and the waters. And these are the ingredients God needed later when it was time to reveal his promise to Noah and to all of us through the rainbow in the sky after the great flood. So when we hear in John 1 that in the beginning was the word and that all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being, this means all of creation. The sun and the moon, the stars and their courses, this fragile earth, our island home as we pray in one of our Eucharistic prayers. The sun's rays, the water droplets, the whole process of sunlight refracting through raindrops after a storm. All of these came into being through the word, the logos, the creative force that was with God from the beginning. The same word that became flesh and dwelt among us, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, the Son of God, is the same creative word who made the sun, the rain, and the rainbow. God spoke to Noah through making a rainbow in the sky, a sign of his promises to the earth and to all living creatures, including us, humankind. And God speaks to us still today through the word through which all things live and move and breathe and have their being. Thanks be to God. Amen.